Um, we are in our last message of a, of a short series called The Comeback. And uh, I just, I love the fact that um, no matter what we go through, uh, God has a comeback for us, right? And we've been talking about people in the Bible that have failed, that struggled, that, that things happen, and how through God th- there was a major comeback. But today I want to talk about um, going from a setback and walking into a comeback. Because the reality is, is that all of us, um, if you're breathing and you have a heartbeat, you're going to experience setbacks in your life, right? We all go through them. And, and if you look at the dictionary definition of a setback, it says a loss of progress, a defeat of a plan, or a reversal of good fortune, anything that sets you back. And so there are people here that you've experienced uh, sickness or death of a loved one or uh, you know, relationships broken up or a loss of a job or whatever it is in your life. It could be anything that you feel like has set you back. And you came to the right place today because you need to know that God has a comeback for you. And so today we're going to look at a guy in the Bible that um, he's synonymous with having the worst setback in all of human history, and that's Job. But he's also synonymous with having the most incredible comeback ever. And so we're going to look at his life today and some of the things that he went through, and hopefully it'll be an encouragement to you. How many need encouragement today? You just need to be encouraged. All right. All right. So we're going to to get right into this. We're going to look at Job chapter 1. Now, I'm going to skip over a lot of it because of time, but I encourage you to go home and read the book of Job. Um, it's, It's crazy. It's crazy. So Job chapter 1, it says, There was a man named Job living in the land of Uz who worshiped God and was faithful to him. He was a good man, careful not to do anything evil. He had seven sons and three daughters and owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, and 1,000 head of cattle and 500 donkeys. He also had a large number of servants and was the richest man in the east. And Job's sons used to take turns giving a feast to which all the others would come, and they always invited their three sisters to join them. The morning after each feast, Job would get up early and offer sacrifices for each of his children in order to purify them. I think that is just such an incredible verse that he would get up and offer. That means he would kill an animal and and do do the whole sacrifice thing uh, on behalf of his children just in case they did anything wrong. I think that's a, a word to us as parents that we need to stand in the gap for our kids, right, and just pray for them and stand stand before the Lord for them. Um, it says that he always did this because he thought that one of them might have sinned by insulting God unintentionally. When the day came for the heavenly beings to appear before the Lord, Satan was there among them. The Lord asked him, what have you been doing? Satan answered, I have been walking here and there, roaming around the earth. Did you notice my servant Job? The Lord asked. There is no one on earth as faithful and good as he is. He worships me and is careful not to do anything evil. Satan replied, would Job worship you if he got nothing out of it? You have always protected him and his family and everything he owns. You bless everything he does. You have given him enough cattle to fill the whole country. But now suppose you take away everything he has. He will curse you to your face. See, that's Satan. He's the accuser of the brethren. All right, the Lord said to Satan, everything he has is in your power, but you must not hurt Job himself. So Satan left. Wow. What a what an incredible story. And the thing is that Job didn't have the benefit of knowing that God was bragging on him. He didn't know that he didn't have the benefit of seeing what was going on behind the scenes. And uh, and the thing about it is, hey, could I just interrupt, just stop for a second? I need our host or someone to make sure these air conditioners are working because I don't see any lights on here. And it's starting to get a little warm. And if you guys could just make sure that everything's working and uh, help us out. How many appreciate that? I mean, we want to be hot. We want to be hot for Jesus, but not that hot. So, you know, I'm just I'm sitting here thinking, OK, um, I'm, you know, we might need to uh, we might need to hand out bags of ice uh, anyway. So in one day, in one day, Job lost his livelihood, he lost his family, he lost his wealth, he lost his prestige, and he lost his health. He was, he was afflicted with something. And, and um, what, a, what a horrible thing in one day to a guy that didn't see it coming, that didn't, had no idea what was going on. 
in one day, he lost everything. You ever felt like that, like you've had a day like that where just everything fell between your, your fingers? Everything went wrong. And this was Job's response. He said, I expected good, but evil showed up. I looked for light, but darkness fell. My stomach is in constant churning. In other words, he has a knot in the, in the pit of his stomach. It never settles down. Some of you live that way, and, um, and Maalox is great, and Tums are great, but the ultimate cure is the peace of God. Um, and so I walk under a black cloud. The sun is gone. So we, we can identify with him that, man, he's, he's in a place where he's just feeling like, man, everything has went wrong, and I don't know why. So today I want to show you five ways to come back from a setback. Does that sound good? So if you're taking notes, I want you to write these down because these are going to be key to you making your comeback from whatever setback you are experiencing. Number one, it's important that we're completely honest with God. God, God wants us to be real with him. He wants us to be authentic. If you're hurting, he wants to know that. If you're struggling, he wants to know that. If you're doubting, he wants to know that. And so this is what Job said. Job said, I call to you, O God, but you never answer. And when I pray, you pay no attention. You are treating me cruelly. You persecute me with all your power. You let the wind blow me away. You toss me about in a raging storm. You know, I know you are taking me off to my death, to the fate in store for everyone. Why do you attack a ruined man? No one as a, uh, one who can do nothing but beg for pity. So he is, he is just being real with God. And I want you to know today that your God wants honesty from you. Because this is the thing that you don't realize, that when you tell God how you really feel, that is actually a form of worship because you are putting all of your attention on him and talking to him. It's one of the first things that Satan tried to steal from Job. Remember, I, I just mentioned earlier that it was so cool that he would sacrifice animals for each of his kids just in case they did anything wrong. He was so passionate that he wanted his kids to be in right relationship with God. So he would, his form of worship was to sacrifice the animals on behalf of his family, right? One of the first things Satan did in this scenario was he eliminated his livestock. So he was trying to eliminate his ability to worship. And isn't it funny when you're going through a setback, the last thing you want to do is worship. You don't feel like it. I don't feel like raising my hands. And the reason why uh, we don't want to worship God, we don't want to be around the people of God when we're struggling is because we feel uh, somehow so detached and that maybe we're blaming things on God. I don't know. Maybe we feel like a failure. I don't know. But the thing is, as long as you have your hands on something, you will not be able to take your hands off it and worship him. When you go through a trauma or a major setback in any way, as a human being, you're going to experience four natural emotions that we see that Job went through. You're going to experience anger. You're going to experience grief. You're going to experience shock. And then you're going to ask questions. And I remember a time in our life, in our family's life, when, when one of our kids had, had an injury and, and I was I was. Uh, really heartbroken, and I was in a, in a hospital emergency room, and I had to get away from everybody, and I walked down a little dead-end hallway that had a bunch of empty hospital beds lined up against the wall. You know those hallways in hospitals, they just put all kinds of junk in there? And I walked down one of those hallways, and I remember just walking up to the wall, and I was pounding my hands against the wall, and I was going, saying, God, how could you? Like, I've given my life for you. I have, I have laid down my career for you. I, I'm following you with all my heart. We have nothing in the material sense uh, because we're following you and we're doing all we can. And this is what I get. I was so angry. That was the emotion that I had at first. But then after a few weeks, I had to get to a place where I was crying out to God by myself. And I remember I got to the realization where I just said, but where else do I go? I don't have anywhere else to go. I'm not going back to the life I lived before. I don't have anywhere else to go but you, Lord. So you're going to have to help me get through it. And God, boy, that was a big one. And so, so, so God just took me from being angry and asking questions to bringing me to a place of peace. Job goes on to say, and so I'm, key, I'm not keeping 
one bit of this quiet. I'm laying it all out on the table. My complaining to high heaven is bitter but honest. So he was being real with God. Listen, your God can handle the fact that you might be frustrated. He would rather you talk to him and be real than to fake it and say, no, I'm good, I'm good, and have a, and have a burning anger in your heart or resentment. He'd rather you be real with him. So he doesn't want you to fake it. And Lamentation says this. It says, as each night watch begins, get up and cry out in prayer. Pour your heart out face to face with the master. God wants to have an encounter with you. And he wants you to tell him what's on your heart and what's on your mind. See, that's called prayer. And that's an amazing gift that we have. So not only does God want us to be completely honest with him, number two, this is your second key to a comeback, that you don't allow bitterness to set in. He says in verse 21, he says, I was born with nothing and I will die with nothing. The Lord gave, and now he has taken away. May his name be praised. In spite of everything that has happened, Job did not sin by blaming God. Job understood. What a perspective to have. I brought nothing into this world, and I'm not taking anything out with me, so anything I ever had was a bonus. What a blessing to have that perspective. I I have to confess, I don't always have that perspective when I lose something. I'm thinking, oh, there's this huge loss. Instead of thanking God for the time that I had with it or even the ability that I had it at all, you know. But this is the reality. An untested faith is no faith at all, is it? It's easy to have faith if everything's going perfect, but what about when everything's going wrong and you still have faith? That's a pure form of faith. So So how do you trust God when your heart is breaking, when everything's went wrong? How do you trust him? By focusing on the fact that God is always good, just like the song we sang. God is always good. It might not make any sense to you. You might not have any idea of how this thing's going to turn out, how it's going to work out. But if you are convinced of the fact that the God that you serve is a good God, guess what? It's in his hands. A lot of people aren't convinced that God is good. They think God is mean. They think God is angry. They think God is a God that is, is constantly after to, to punish you and to drive you deep into the ground. And th- that's, that's a warped view of God. Because the reality is this. You and I have the power to either worry or to worship. That's, that's our power right there. And so First Chronicles says, go to the Lord for help. And worship him continually. How do you go to the Lord for help? It's this wonderful gift called prayer. Now, a lot of people think that if you pray in the King James, you're a lot more spiritual and God hears it. I think you bore God when you pray in the King James. I think God loves to hear that little New York thing on the back end of it. Like, you know, forget about it, Lord. I don't know. You know, I was on Monday morning. I was having some coffee and and forget about it. I don't know. I think the Lord's like, Peter, check this out. Listen to this. I love it. I love it. God wants you to be real. God wants you. I just I just bashed all of the New Yorkers in the room. Did you did you catch that? Um, I'm just playing with you. I'm playing with you. Prayer is one of the most incredible gifts that we have because it's it's our ability to connect and communicate with our maker, with God. It's not this formal religious thing. It's not if if I say the our father, you know, I mean, that, that's an awesome prayer. There's a lot in there, but that's not what it's about. It's about connecting with your God, just like you would connect with your best friend, where you communicate. And sometimes the communication is nonverbal. Have you noticed that with people closest to you? You can sit there and not say a word and communicate. That's how most men communicate, by the way. Um, how was the men's retreat? Good. We just said it all. You ask your wife how the women's retreat was, you better sit down and you better make sure you'd already went to the bathroom because you're going to hear for the next eight hours how awesome that retreat was. And you know I'm right. And we need to pray for you wives that you kind of, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but but it's, it's, it, communication is, 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 is just about connecting and, and understanding. And so prayer is your path back to your comeback. 
You want to come back? You need, you need to start spending time with God and say, God, I don't get what's going on. And God will start to drop things in your heart and your soul through his word, through, through whatever. I just heard a testimony this morning of someone that said that they, they needed to hear from God on something. And they were, doing their, they were actually reading a novel, a Christian novel, and there was something in that book where they felt like God spoke to them and confirmed the very thing that they were needing an answer to through that. God will use anything to speak to us if we're listening. And I just love that fact. So prayer is the path back to your comeback. Because what lies behind you and what lies before you is very small compared to what lies within you. God wants to work in your heart and in your life. And he knows how you feel. He knows where you're at. He knew exactly what Job was struggling with. But God had the whole picture. Job didn't. And you and I don't have the whole picture most of the time. The third thing is to connect with others who will help you focus on God. We need to connect with others. Now, I'm not saying that you throw it all out there to just anyone because you and I know, even in a church setting, there are people that you're not going to share everything with, and you shouldn't. But God always brings that person in your life that's, that's a friend faithful unto death, that you could share anything with and not be judged, not be condemned, not going to get all religious on you and say, well, God, I can't believe you did that. That's not what you want to hear. You, you need someone to say, you know what, maybe you messed up and then some, but I, you know what, I'm going to get down in that pit with you and I'm going to help you walk out of that and we're going to do it together. That's the kind of friend that, that we need. And God puts people in our lives and, and so sometimes you need people that can believe God for you when you are struggling to believe God in something. Joseph, uh, Job had a friend named Elihu who gave him this advice, the, probably some of the greatest advice in the Bible other than Solomon's advice um, in Proverbs. This is awesome. He says, don't let your anger and the pain you endured make you sneer at God. Your reputation and riches cannot protect you from distress nor can you find safety in the dark and wor- the dark world below. Be on guard. Don't turn to evil as a way of escape. God's power is unlimited. He needs no teachers to guide or correct him. Others have praised God for what he's done, so join with them. Let me paraphrase what Elihu said to him. He said basically that pain is the great equalizer. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor prominent or simple. It doesn't matter any of that. All of us are going to walk through seasons of pain. All of us. That's what he was saying. It's impartial. And, and I love this next part is he said, never use evil to ease the pain. You know what he's, I, I, right away I thought about people that self-medicate themselves, whether whatever it is, to as a way of escape from whatever pain they're walking in. And he's saying, don't do that. You know, in order for there to be real healing, in order for there to be real breakthrough, God wants to expose the thing that's hurting you. It's like ripping the scab off so that he can do a real deep healing in your life and you can truly be free and walk in freedom. Ali who's saying, don't, don't resort to things that are evil to try to escape the pain. You've got to face it head on. And then he, I love you, he said, you've got to just spend more time with other people, people that you can trust. In the midst of Job's pain, he's able to say this, true wisdom and real power belong to God. From him we learn how to live and also what to live for. Now you need to understand that not everyone's going to give you the, great, the, the best advice. You ever have that person, man, that just, just says something sideways and you're just like, man, I just really want to go out and put my head in a blender right now because they just jacked with me. You, you, you know, there's always going to be that person that's going to be critical and judgmental, and you don't want to share with, the, with those kind of people. And yes, they're in the church. But you want to find people that will look at you for who you are, not for what you've done or how you failed or whatever, but, but that are going to walk with you and stick with you. Now, sometimes it comes from the the places you would least expect that people giving you bad advice. So Job had a wife, and she was not at her best here. (laughs) And she said this. She said, still holding on to your precious integrity, are you? Curse God and be done with it. Now, I love his response. He says, you're talking like an empty-headed fool. (laughs) And no, husbands, you can't use it because it's in the Bible. It's wrong. You, You will have a frying pan upside your head if you try that. We take the good days from God. 
why not also take the bad days? Not once through all this did Job sin. He said nothing against God. Man, what a perspective he had. And he has no idea what's really going on in the heavenlies. The fourth thing is that we need to completely surrender our future to God, and that's what Job did. What does complete trust look like in God? This is, well, this is what he said. God may kill me, but still I will trust him. That's complete trust in God. That's complete surrender. Where you say, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but however it turns out, he's still going to be my God, and I'm going to trust him all the way, even if I'm going to die in this. And I think that's the, the most awesome perspective that you could have. You and I have Jesus. Job didn't uh, have that benefit, but we have it. And Jesus reassures us about our future. And this is what Jesus said. He said, if God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you and take pride in you and do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax. I love that. Jesus is just saying, chill out. Just relax. To not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things. But you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out you'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Jesus is saying, don't stress. Relax. I got this. I love that commercial where that, I don't even know what the commercial's for, but the guy goes, stay in your lane, bro. <laughs> I love that. I don't know. I Yeah, no one else I've ever seen it, but I love it. I love it. He's like a hippie biker dude. And he goes, stay in your lane, bro. It's a tattoo guy. And he tattoos the wrong thing on the arm. And he goes, just stay in your lane, bro. I love that. Anyway, it's, it has nothing to do with anything. So let's talk about the comeback. I want, now I want to talk about the comeback of Job. This is where everything starts to turn and go in a different direction. We're going to go all the way to the end of Job now. He's went through all of this stuff. And his friends, by the way, who started out being encouragers, kind of got a little weird. And they started giving him bad advice, and they really ticked God off. God was mad at his friends for some of the advice they had given him. And Job, thank God, didn't listen to him. And I love the fact that Job was such a faithful man that even in the midst of his crisis and his horrible pain that he was experiencing, he was still interceding for his friends so God wouldn't punish him. That's the faithfulness of God, and that got God's attention that he was still praying for others even when he himself was hurting so much. So this is what it says. After Job had interceded for his friends, God restored his fortune and then doubled it. All his brothers and sisters and friends came to his house and celebrated, and they told him how sorry they were and consoled him for all the trouble God had brought him. Each of them brought generous housewarming gifts. God blessed Job's latter life even more than his earlier life. He ended up with... 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 team of oxen and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. There was not a woman in that country as beautiful as Job's daughters. Their father treated them as equals with their brothers, providing them the same inheritance. Job lived on another 140 years, living to see his children and grandchildren, four generations of them, and then he died an old man of full life. What a great story. And as I close today, our band's going to come back out. I want to just shift now to you and I. Um, when we are in the midst of a setback, the last thing I want to talk about in order to make the comeback is that we ne need to trust Jesus with every detail. We need to trust him with every detail. Before Jesus was arrested, he was giving his disciples some last words. And he, and he said, do you finally believe? In fact, you are about to make a run for it, saving your own skins and abandoning me. But I'm not abandoned. The Father is with me. I've told you all this so that trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. In this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. But take heart, I have conquered the world. Listen, my friend, we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that God had cursed because of sin. 
And on this side of heaven, you and I experience pain. We experience sickness. We experience death. We experience heartache. That, that it's, it's, it's not God. It, it's the world we live in. It's the result of what happened in the Garden of Eden. And you and I go through these things. That's why, to me, heaven seems so appealing and so awesome because there's going to come a day that we take our last breath here and we're going to take our next breath with him and we'll be free from all of that. I long for that. I long to see him. I long to be with him. But until that happens, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure as many people as I can come to know him. Because the only thing I can take to heaven with me is people. And the only thing you can take with you is people. You know, the, the uh, California has just been plagued with for years with these wildfires that hit. They've had that problem this year again. And, and um, what's crazy is a lot of these houses, not every house is burning down, but a lot of them are. And these are houses with fireproof siding and fireproof shingles on the roofs. Fireproof. And yet some of them are burning down. And so they, they went back and they kind of did some research of why some of these houses are burning down and not some others. And what they found is very interesting. This is what they found that some of the houses that burnt, it was because the homeowners weren't keeping their gutters clean and the dried leaves were catching fire because of the embers that were dropping and the fire was starting under the shingles and burning the eaves of the house first and then the house would catch fire. And I thought when I heard that, like, what a spiritual principle. <laughs> Are you keeping your gutters clean? Not in your house but in your life? Are there things that, that that you're holding on to, things that just junk, just things that, that, are, that, that are useless, worthless, but, but they're there, and, and you haven't taken the time to get rid of all that, and then when, when trouble hits, those things ignite and burn the whole, burn the whole thing up. And I want to just encourage you today that, that part of Part of making sure that doesn't happen is that we trust Jesus with every detail of our life because, it, the, the, as they say, the devil's in the details. Uh, it, it, to these homeowners, you know, they have these beautiful houses that are fireproof, but, but the little detail of their gutters would bring down the whole house. Could we stand? And, friend, I just want to um, just ask you a question today. Um, you just heard today that it doesn't matter who you are, you're going to walk through setbacks. You're going to walk through things. You're going to walk through issues. But this is the thing, and that goes for the Christian and the non-Christian. I, I would rather walk through something with him than try to get through it without him. Because I tried that, and it doesn't work. And so maybe you're here today, and you're like, man, I, my heart is just, Right now, my heart is exploding. Like, I, I want to know this God. I want to have a relationship with this God. I want to learn how to pray to this God. I, I want to be a follower of this God, of Jesus. And you've never done that. You know, Ben Rasa uh, in the back there spoke an incredible team rally devotion today. And he, and he, and he shared a great story about a woman who was at Splish Splash and she went into this 10-foot pool, and she was starting to drown. And, and it wasn't at that time where he needed to come up and say, hey, let me tell you about what lifeguards do. Let me tell you about the training that they go through. Let me tell you about why they're – she didn't need any – she just needed the lifeguard. And I'm just – many, probably all of us have heard about Jesus. We've even heard about what he did, but the reality is, is we need him. And so I'm going to say a prayer today. I'm going to lead us all in this prayer. It's just a simple prayer of invitation. And I'd love everyone to pray it with me if you would, but especially those of you that are like, man, this is for me today, right now. I'm, I'm going to put my faith and trust in Jesus, every detail of my life. I want you to pray that especially. So everyone, just pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing me here today. And Lord, I am convinced without a shadow of a doubt that you've came and you gave your life for me. And so right now, I choose to put my faith and my trust and my hope in you. I ask you, God, to change me and transform me. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of all my sins 
and to make me brand new on the inside. Change my heart. Change my life. Thank you for this awesome gift. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.